Uh, thank you very much for the invitation or for the opportunity. Um, I'm, a, I'm a human geneticist, and I got into comparative genomics because we reasoned that um, it might be a good idea to look at differences between humans and non-human apes and other primates in order to understand what makes us human. Uh, we failed. We don't know what makes us human. But we find a lot of interesting things along the road. Uh, and it's been, it's been quite a journey. Um, as I said, what really motivated us at the beginning is to try and understand the basis for adaptation of complex phenotypes in humans. And those includes adaptations that ultimately make us more susceptible to diseases. Um, but we didn't know how to do that. And, and we were committed to try to do that by, by studying humans and, and our close extant evolutionary relatives. Um, not go to mice or other model systems, and that, of course, makes everything uh, challenging in some respect because of the ethical and practical considerations of accessing uh, humans and non-human apes. And so back in 2003, we started uh, simply comparing uh, gene expression levels between species with the hope of understanding uh, combined with the comparisons at the sequence level, understanding uh, I have some perspective on how uh, gene expression change, regulatory change, and perhaps ultimately uh, connected to some form of adaptation of complex phenotypes, and we failed. Uh, around 2007, uh, when we couldn't really push it through to the complex phenotypes, we decided to take a step back, and since we have now such great maps of differences in gene expression, transcript expression between species, and we understand something about the evolutionary forces that shape those transcript expression, even though everything we say about complex phenotypes is just, at that point, storytelling, uh, we can go back and study regulatory mechanisms. And uh, that has been work that, that still is still ongoing and work that um, continue to evolve as new technology evolves and new protocols evolves and the ability to visualize and characterize new regulatory mechanisms uh, evolve and, and it, it's work that, that opened up a whole, I think, window into uh, studies of regulatory variation within population between humans, the entire EQTL field and regulatory QTL field. And I, I think that uh, for me, for, for us, the, the journey was very satisfying and that interplay between comparative genomics with large effect size where causality is out the window uh, to within species where effect size are smaller, but you can make more inference about causality using some, for some form of mediation analysis uh, was really gratifying. But really the first time we were finally able to take one step towards some measure of complex phenotypes was when we studied changes in, in protein expression. Uh, still everything that had to do with complex phenotypes itself uh, remained just storytelling. And then in 2011, where finally in 2013 we established it, we started working on adaptation in cell culture. Now that's a far cry from adaptation in vivo or anything you can do with actual model species. And in this conference, um, you know, we're at, uh, at, at clearly at a disadvantage where a lot of you are working on actual organisms and, and animals uh, and multiple species and can perform experiments. Uh, we are committed to working on humans and chimpanzees and, and species that we don't want to really touch uh, and so everything is, is still in vitro, but uh, it's using a system that we couldn't use before, uh, which is the iPSCs. So this is a legacy slide, which for sentimental reasons and some uh, bet I'm never changing, uh, but the numbers are updated. We now have close to 20 uh, validated chimpanzees iPSCs and actually close to 200 human iPSCs. And, uh, a lot of them are done exactly in the same uh, technique, using the same technique, and they're, they're really highly validated and of high quality. Um, we validate them using a large number of assays, including, of course, making sure that they're fully pluripotent, making sure that the clones that we choose represent the particular individuals from which the clone was derived. Uh, routinely, when we wake them up, we check their karyotype, and, and those are fluid, and so a lot of the time we have to just terminate some clones and go back to clones that are uh, healthy and have a healthy uh, karyotype. Uh, at the beginning of this journey, we used to do teratoma assays, and uh, thankfully the field moved away from those as, as a critical uh, checkpoint. Uh, of course, we do EBs for every uh, cell 
And actually, we continue to do these EBs routinely to just make sure that the lines uh, continue. We, we have a lot of early stage lines, but even the late stage lines are continue to be fully uh, pluripotent. As you may have heard, I worry a lot about batch effects, and so we have uh, studied at great length and at, 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 at great detail the potential batch effects that might impact work with uh, stem cells. Uh, what I'm showing you here specifically is the uh, relative impact of starting uh, the iPSC generation from individuals that are from different populations, so different population of species of uh, chimpanzee, uh, what, what, what some or maybe most call subspecies, uh, different populations in humans, and um, we showed that whether you study gene expression, DNA methylation, and I didn't put other slides here on histone modification, accessibility, and so on, the, uh, obviously the species effect is uh, much more pronounced than the effect of the different population, but you still have the effect of different population visualized, which is a good thing because it means that the uh, stem cell reprogramming maintains the genetic identity of the donor and whatever variation you see actually uh, between individuals. Uh, an interesting observation that we confirmed and, and, and now using a large number of tissues is that there's less regulatory variation in, in iPSCs than in practically any other uh, tissue that was studied. Uh, terminal cell types, here specifically you see the difference between fibroblast LCLs and iPSCs, and the bifurcation of the trees on the two sides are uh, the different species, and, and in the iPSCs, uh, you can see, you can see, in the iPSCs, uh, there are, uh, there's just much less variation than in any other cell type. And that is interesting, of course, because everything that intuitively we immediately uh, associate with early developmental stages, canalization, and I'll, I'll kind of get back to it when I demonstrate two utilities of these iPSCs. Uh, we spent a lot of time, uh, really uh, a fair amount of time in our lab, uh, validating differences or, or, or studying differences between differentiated cells uh, from these iPSCs and uh, primary tissues. And I'm going to uh, take a minute to explain how important that is and to acknowledge that this, while not perfect, uh, 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 is something that we think about and, and, and does show that this model is useful. Um, so the, the issue here is that uh, we are doing in vitro work and we are doing in vitro work because we are unable to do in vivo work. And when you're a human geneticist, the, the, the two competing uh, models that you have are always in vitro cell lines or go to mice or other model system that are acceptable depending on the phenotype that you're studying. And mice are not humans, and in vitro is not in vivo. And you never can never get out of those types of criticisms. They're all valid, uh, but the fact is that you're not going to experiment on humans, and you're not going to experiment on chimps. And so we are choosing the uh, in vitro uh, system. We are choosing to work, though, not on, on immortalized cell lines that are more standard, but on those differentiated uh, cells from iPSCs. And we study in great detail the similarities and differences between uh, the differentiated cells and the primary tissues that they're supposed to model to understand to what extent those systems, the in vitro systems, are faithful, to what extent they're useful. And we optimize different protocols in order to create cells that are uh, closer to the primary tissue. So in this particular example, we're going for cardiomyocytes and we're using different protocols to generate cardiomyocytes, and we're testing the gene expression, the methylation, other phenotypes uh, in those cardiomyocytes, comparing them to the same data collected from primary hearts, sometimes from primary hearts from the same animals from which we actually created the iPSCs, because this, is, this has been a long process, uh, samples that I've, I and my lab have been collected for actually almost 20 years, and some of these chimps pass away, and then we were able to collect their hearts. Not anymore. The NIH has a moratorium on collection, uh, but uh, we have a lot of those tissues in our freezers. So I'm not going to uh, ask you to read all this. This is, this is a large slide that shows uh, that essentially cardiomyocytes are most similar to hearts. But there's also a take-home message, which is that you'll never confuse cardiomyocytes with hearts. Cardiomyocytes form their own clusters, 
Uh, they don't look like anything else other than hearts, but they also don't exactly look like hearts. Uh, but when you actually look f uh, closely to figure out what are those regulatory differences between cardiomyocytes and hearts, you discover that the vast majority, 70, 75% of those genes, can be explained by the culturing conditions. They're not necessarily artifacts associated with the fact that this is an in vitro differentiated cardiomyocyte, but for example, differences that are associated with the fact that you don't have lipids in your culturing media. And so a lot of the genes that respond to lipid metabolism are shut down in those in vitro cardiomyocytes. Uh, you can perform experiment with uh, primary cardiomyocytes cultured the same way and you can get uh, a little bit closer profile. So uh, the take home message here is that these systems are useful, they're far from perfect, but you can characterize the extent to which they're useful and the extent to which they might not give you faithful information. So with that in mind, I wanna, I wanna just tell you two quick projects without getting into too much details, uh, just provide examples of the utility of this system in comparative genomics. And, and of course, I, I chose two uh, studies uh, that you couldn't perform using frozen tissue samples or the standard uh, immortalized cell lines. The first study is a study of comparative of a developmental trajectories that, of course, is impossible to do other than in vitro in, in humans and chimp. And the second study is, is really the reason we started this back in 2011, which is to study some phenotypes that are a little bit more complex than just study the molecular uh, 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 profile of a sample. And I uh, call this project the in vitro heart attack. We are changing the oxygen level in a cardiomyocyte. So here's the first project. It's a comparative study of endoderm differentiation. We started with this. Uh, honestly, for no other reason that it was just the first differentiation protocol that worked in the lab uh, for both species. Um, it's a three-day protocol. It's easy. Uh, of course, since we, it's comparative genomics and we can't have batch effects, we require that the cells will differentiate to the same endpoint using the exact same protocol. And it's surprisingly difficult, actually, to have one protocol uh, working with similar efficiency in both species. And so as we uh, develop more, more protocols that, and today we have quite a few for hepatocytes, for cardiomyocytes, for uh, uh, chondrocytes, for uh, other cell types, but the first one was, was the definitive endoderm. So it's a three-day protocol. We did it in four iPSCs from chimps, in four iPSCs from humans, plus a couple of replicates. Um, and skipping uh, nine months of QC, I immediately will jump to the fact that most regulatory trajectories here are highly conserved in human and chimp. Um, and, and that was completely expected that uh, definitive endoderm is such a, a fundamental basic tissue uh, shared uh, in, in, in all mammals and, and, and obviously highly conserved in human and chimp. And so we expected that and that was actually in many ways good to see because that means that our iPSCs in human and chimps and the differentiation protocol performs equally. Uh, what was surprising to us, but I think also very rewarding, is to observe this reduced within species variation in gene expression in primitive streak, which is the samples in day one, uh, uh, an observation that we didn't have in any other uh, day. So what you see here is the uh, the uh, p-values rejecting the null hypothesis that the f-test that 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 uh, assumes that there is no differences in variation, and these plots are a little more complicated to explain. These rely on the uh, pi zero estimate from one species, given that you observe reduction in another species. But the take-home message is that this pattern is highly shared. So it's not that random genes have reduced variation within uh, the species across individuals as the differentiation moves from day zero to day one. These are genes that consistently have reduced variation uh, in both humans and chimpanzees. And so this idea that you really canalize this differentiation to a particular developmental state, a particular network state that you need to hit uh, roughly at the same point at the same time with hundreds of genes uh, is something that we see in, in both species. And that, that's not something that we've ever uh, seen before. And in fact, it, it really changes a little bit the way that we now think about uh, analyzing these types of comparative data because we're no longer just looking at these changes in gene expression. 
thinking, well, in one species it went up by this much, in another species it went up by only this much, uh, so that's different. We're not thinking of hitting a particular state, a particular regulatory state, and if you're already there, maybe you don't need to change much. Uh, that doesn't mean that there's a difference between the species. If you hit the same state, that might mean that you were already where you're supposed to be, and that state might be conserved. And it's a little bit different way of, of analyzing the data. The second project I want to tell you about is, is, is really where I think uh, most of this lead, and, and we have uh, three projects like that now in the lab, uh, but I chose to sp speak about this one because this one is, is the most mature, in fact, already published. Um, and so what we do here is we take cardiomyocytes and we grow them in normoxic uh, oxygen conditions. And so for those of you who don't do much cell culture or did cell culture only you know, briefly during your training, you probably cultured cells in just atmospheric oxygen, which is 21%. That's not normoxic conditions. That's high oxidative stress for your cells. Uh, they're actually, a, which is a topic for another uh, whole different uh, conference or, or there are a large number of papers that uh, got their results a little bit wrong because they measure everything in oxidative stress conditions. So these cells start from normoxia. By the way, most of my lab obviously does it at oxygen levels that is atmospheric. Uh, so I'm sure that we get that problem too. But in this particular case, since we had to give them a heart attack, we can't start with oxidative stress conditions. So we start with uh, uh, eight to 10% oxygen that's condition A, we move them to 1%, that's condition B, we keep them there for six uh, uh, hours or, and, and uh, move them back to uh, normoxic condition, and we have two uh, recuperation, two conditions where they can uh, stay in that ox high oxygen level, 8%, before we uh, measure the RNA as well, again, either six hours at C or 24 hours at D. And let me tell you, Immediately, because you might wonder, by 24 hours, namely 24 hours after reperfusion, uh, the cells are nearly indistinguishable than what they had at uh, the starting point at A, uh, which means that this entire process was uh, generating back the, the cells we started with, and you no longer, or almost no longer, have any indication of stress. Um, so uh, reperfusion gives them high oxidative stress before it goes back. B, of course, is, is lack of oxygen, and that's kind of the, you know, fondly I refer to this as the heart attack. Now, much of the, of the, of the response is conserved, but you see in these plots are just the uh, dot plots of gene expression differences in uh, chimpanzee on the Ys and the humans on the X, from A to B, from B to C, and from B to D, and everything is, or almost everything is near the diagonal. You see something uh, a little bit of uh, a, a subset of genes in uh, color that represents the differences between species in that response, but most of it is conserved. Here are examples of conservation. These are genes that are important uh, because we know something about their function and they respond uh, very similarly. Uh, I gave this example mainly because of this gene where you can see that the actual level of expression, sorry, I thought that you see the uh, the gene in the middle, you can see that the actual level of expression between the species is quite different, but the response, response pattern uh, across conditions is actually uh, almost exactly the same. Now, I'm not going to take you through this slide uh, in great detail, but tell you the take-home message is that, that these genes with interspecies conserved response are actually unusual, and they're important for human disease in many ways. They're enriched among CVD, uh, GWAS, they enrich them on particular genes that are seen to participate in different disease processes uh, that affect the heart, and they're depleted for EQTLs that are identified in GTEC. So, so those EQTLs that are basically uh, high effect sizes shared among a large number of tissues, those are not the conserved response genes for heart attack and reperfusion. So they have a lot of signatures of, of importance and, and they create this, they generate this list of genes that provide additional promising targets that, uh, for, for, for follow-up. And this is not, you know, for the first time in my career, this is not this hand-waving, uh, you know, these seem to be under selection, let's follow them up. We never will because I don't believe the selection in the first place. These are actually genes that respond to particular medically relevant intervention in a conserved way between two species. They're highly enriched in process that we care about. These are real uh, 
worthy targets of follow-up, and, and, and some of them we do. Uh, there are obviously also differences, and those are extremely interesting. Differences in response, genes that respond particularly in chimp, genes that respond particularly in human. As you may know, uh, there is uh, quite a lot of work about the differences between human and chimp in the way that the, the two species experience cardiovascular disease, and some of these genes are just, you know, the storytelling about them, the, what we know about them, uh, may fit right in to try to explain those phenotypic differences. And so I think for the first time, we have, uh, through this in vitro system, some access uh, towards these processes that we couldn't address using uh, frozen tissues, standard cell lines, and clearly not any way in vivo in these uh, species. So the iPSCs are really cool, and you should have some. Uh, we are sharing these iPSCs. We have been sharing them for many years. We can't share them overseas because of CITES, especially with the new rules. Uh, it's, it's practically impassable. It's just impossible. Uh, we tried. Uh, but we are sharing them uh, domestically. We shared them with 26 labs already in the United States. There are, in fact, more papers using uh, panels of chimpanzee iPSCs that we created from other labs than from my own lab. And we're pretty proud of that. Uh, we're sharing them with no restriction or limitations. We don't need to be a collaborator. We don't ask you what you do with them. We don't care if you compete with us. It, it's just the resources, and that's how we treat it. Here's a you know, quick and dirty summary that I'm kind of proud of, of the type of topics that people use our iPSCs in their papers. That's not papers from my group. Uh, and, and all it takes is an email and a couple of forms with your keys, and we give you the cells. Uh, I'll end by acknowledging Yerkes and, and Southwest Foundation and DRI because I wouldn't have a career in comparative genomics if not for these primate centers. Uh, hard work and continued commitment uh, and, and, and collaborations with our scientists that uh, rely on these samples. And of course, NAGRI as well as NAGMS and HBI for, for funding this type of work for so many years. Thank you. Thank you.